Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Listen, fellas and girls, it's a breakfast party. Yes, it's a party every time you have a heaping bowl full of delicious Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat topped with milk or cream and fruit. Try it. Taste the crispness of Quaker puffed wheat and rice, the luscious nut-like flavor. Start tomorrow. Make it a party every morning with this taste-tempting treat. Delicious, nourishing Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. David Andrews and his young wife, Mary, lived in a cabin in the foothills a couple of miles south of Selkirk. David had come to the Yukon Territory with his older brother, Barry. The two young men, David was 22, Barry 25, had been inseparable. And when David met and married Mary in Selkirk six months ago, the brothers had built another bedroom onto their cabin so that Barry could stay with them. Their small claim had given out, and David and Barry turned to fur trapping as a livelihood. One evening, after the thaw in the spring, Barry had ridden his horse to town for a few supplies. As David helped his wife with the dishes, she noticed his serious, brooding expression. She glanced at him smilingly and then smoked. David, dear, why so quiet? What's the matter? Oh, gosh, honey. Barry and I have so little to show for all the trapping we've done. We've barely made a living the past winter. I know, David, but we've managed to get by. We have a great deal to be thankful for. Our marriage has been such a happy one, and Barry is so kind and considerate that... <laughs> you know, someday you and Barry may be supplying the Hudson's Bay Company with more furs than they can use. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be the day. Oh, come on. Stop looking so grumpy. <laughs> All right, you win, oh, honey. Oh, there, that's better. Um, say, you'd better put that plate down before you rub a hole through it with a towel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So busy thinking, I didn't realize I still had it. You know, honey, sometimes I wonder if somebody's been stealing from our traps and then resetting them. Oh. Don't be so suspicious, dear. The season was poor for trapping, that's all. Yeah, maybe you're right. I sure was counting on... Meantime, Barry was about to leave the trading post with his supplies when two men entered. Jacques Beauvais, a gruff French trapper, and his friend, Gil Carter. Well, so it is our young friend, Barry Andrew. <laughs> well, you and your brother have found many fur this season, perhaps, eh? You know better than that, Jacques. Your traps are out our way, and the catch has been poor, as far as we're concerned. Oh, you hear, Gil? These brothers are not do so well as Jack. <laughs> it is knowing how to set the trap that counts, mon ami. <laughs> they ought to take lessons from you, Jack. Maybe they don't know about your good fortune, huh? What good fortune? What are you talking about? Uh, I tell you, Barry. You see, I have sell my fur for $2,000. $2,000? You mean to say you caught that many on the trap line you have out our way? Sure, of course. I have worked hard. I have catch many fine pelt berry. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, look, I show you. Voila! There is the money. Holy mackerel. What I can't see is how you could get so much and we got so little when our traps are set in the same vicinity. Oh, my good luck is your misfortune. Two thousand dollars worth is more than anyone would expect. 
Even in a good trapping country. Perhaps, but that is what I have received. Wait until I order some supplies, Barry. Then I'll take you with Gil and me to the cafe to celebrate, eh? No, no thanks. I have to get back. I'll be seeing you later. So long. Au revoir. Au revoir. A little while later, Mary and David looked up as Barry entered the cabin. Hi. Oh, Barry. Hi. Well, I'm glad I stayed long enough to get out of helping with the dishes. <laughs> there. I think I re remembered everything, Mary. Oh, you always do, Barry. It's this husband of mine who usually forgets something. Mm. <laughs> because I'm always thinking of hurrying back to my little wife. Uh, <laughs> David always comes up with the right answers anyway. Oh, you should have seen him a little while ago, Barry. The way he looked at me, I began to think he was getting tired of me. <laughs> you know better than that, honey. <laughs> Fact is, Barry, I got to thinking about how little we had to show for the work we've done. And I was telling, David, it must have been a poor season for trapping, that's all. Well, I was almost convinced of that until I heard the news about Jacques Beauvais at the trading post. Oh? What news, Barry? Well, it seems Jacques received about $2,000 for a lot of furs he trapped during the season. Wait a minute. Jacques had his traps in these foothills, too, just south of ours. Yeah, I know. Is Jacques the man who has the small cabin about half a mile down the trail from here? Yes. By thunder, I'll bet that's the answer. What do you mean, David? I suspected someone was stealing from our traps. Now I'm sure that it was Jacques. By golly, if we had proof of that, I'd settle with him. But as it is, there's nothing we can do about it. I'll get my coat. Stay here with Mary till I get back, Barry. Will you? Oh, David, where are you going? Hold on, David. What are you going to do? I'm riding to Jacques' cabin and have a talk with him. He isn't there. He's in town, the cafe, celebrating. All right, then I'll go to the cafe to see oh, him. Oh, David, please. Don't worry, I don't expect to create but trouble. But, David, I don't... Barry think... says there's nothing we can do. Well, maybe he's right. But at least I'll have the satisfaction of telling that sneaking Jacques Beauvais what I think of him and of letting him know I'm wise to how he got so many furs to sell. Later that evening at the cafe, Jacques Beauvais sat at one of the tables with Gil Carter. Jacques was not the type to attract many friends. Gil Carter was one of the few with whom he associated whenever he came to town. Jacques was in a gay mood as he talked to Gil. Tonight, mon ami, the treat is all on me. Perhaps you should give up the digging for gold and be wise like Jacques, eh? <laughs> the fur have put much cash in my pocket. Ah, uh, you sure been lucky, Jacques. May we, Gil. And along with the luck, there was much of the hard work. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dave. You hear about Jacques? How come you didn't trap much, Dave? Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard about Jacques' sale. I think I know why we didn't trap much. Where is Jacques Beauvais? Uh, he's sitting over there with Carter. Ask him for pointers on trapping, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps you have brought a lot of pelts to town tonight, huh, Andrew? Well, good money <laughs> of our furs were brought to town, all right, Beauvais. But you're the one who got the cash for them. I do not understand that kind of talk. I do not like it very much. I don't care whether you like it or not. Suspected that someone was stealing from our traps. As far as I'm concerned, you're the crook who stole them. Good to have proof of that, Dave. Yeah, that's strong talk you're handing out. I'll give you a chance to take that back, Andrew. Saying a thing like that can lead to trouble, Dave. All right, let it. What I said still goes. Some of that cash Jacques has rightfully belongs to Barry and me. Because proof or no proof, I'm saying he stole from our traps. I've heard enough from you. <laughs> That is just a taste of what you'll get if you continue to throw the insult at Jacques Bobet. Now I go to my cabin. Next time, Andrew, do not get off so easy. <laughs> it sure was some sock he gave you, Dave, here. Let me help you get up. He took me off guard. Sure. <laughs> you can bet Jacques Bobet will be sorry for that. And for stealing our furs, too. A short time later, Barry Andrews, who had decided to follow his brother David to town, entered the cafe and approached the barkeep. Hey, Joe. Huh? Yeah. Have you seen my brother David? Ah, uh, yeah, Barry. He was in here just a little while ago, but he left. Was Jacques Beauvais in here then? Ah, uh, he sure was. Dave got into a squabble with him, and Jacques knocked him down and then left. Uh-oh. What brought that about? I uh, can't say exactly, Barry. Gil Carter was sitting with Jacques. He could tell you all about it, but he left just a few minutes ago. Well, I, I can find out from David when I see him. He must still be around town someplace. I'll go find him. I'll see you later, Joe. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, Barry. The following morning, Sergeant Preston arrived in Selkirk and reigned to a stop in front of the constable's office. 
Old Blackie, old fella. Steady. Come on, King. Hello, Bill. Well, sure glad to see you, Sergeant. <laughs> Hi, King. Just about to leave, Sergeant. I expect to have a busy day. Oh, what's up? Two prospectors came in from Whitehorse early this morning. Came in here to tell me they passed a cabin on the trail a ways. And seeing the door partly open, they stopped to investigate. They found the body of a man inside. It was Jacques Beauvais. He'd been murdered. Beauvais murdered? That's right. Went to the cabin and found that Beauvais had been knifed. The weapon's missing. I see. Do you suspect anyone? Not yet. Couldn't find any clues. I warned the two prospectors to keep quiet so the news hasn't leaked out yet. I'm going now to ask a few questions here and there. Good idea, King, and I'll go along with you. Fine, let's go. Come on, fella. It was close to noontime when the constable and Sergeant Preston, with King running alongside, rode the trail toward the Andrews cabin. Bill, I realize from all we've heard that it looks bad for David Andrews, but I can't convince myself that he'd do a thing like that. I know how you feel, Sergeant. But everybody at the cafe heard him threaten Jacques last night. And he certainly had a strong enough motive. I know. Frankly, I hope he has a good alibi. We have to take David in as a suspect. It'll be a hard blow to his wife. And if Dave doesn't have a good, tight alibi for every minute of his time, there's nothing to do but take him in. Here's her place. Whoa, Blackie. Hold on. Oh, easy, boy. You can come in with us, King. Oh, how nice. You're just in time to eat with us. Do come in. Thanks, Mary. And King, the finest dog in the Yukon. <laughs> oh, Dave, Barry, we have company. Set plates for Sergeant Preston and the constable. Hi, Sergeant. Glad to see you. Hello, Dave. How are you, Constable? Fine, thanks. You two look so serious, you'd think you were on a hot trail. <laughs> they went that away, Sergeant. We are serious, Barry. We're oh. here on very serious business. You see... Jacques Beauvais was found dead in his cabin this morning, murdered. Oh, no. Gosh, that is serious. In a way, I'm sorry for him, but he probably had it coming to him. Oh, David, please don't say such a thing. We understand from several people in town that you threatened to get even with Jacques in the cafe last night, David. Ah, oh, see, here, Sergeant, you accusing me... Can of... you account for your time after you left the cafe? Well, I was plenty sore. Didn't come right home. I... Decided to ride over and investigate the location where, uh, where we set our traps. I sort of hoped I'd find some way of proving I was right about him stealing our furs. You would have had plenty of time then to have gone to Jacques' cabin, Dave. Oh, no. David wouldn't. You can't accuse it him. It isn't easy to say, believe me. But I'm afraid we'll have to take you in, Dave, as a suspect. You had a strong motive. You threatened Jacques and you have no alibi. Oh, David, this is terrible. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. We'll do all we can to prove you didn't, David, but just now... Just I'm a... a minute, Sergeant. What were you going to say, Barry? Oh, you... You needn't take David back with you to jail. He's not the man you want, Sergeant. No? Then who is, Barry? I am. What? I'm the one who murdered Jacques Beauvais. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Say, the strangest thing happened here in the studio this afternoon. You won't believe it. I was standing in front of the microphone, sort of thinking out loud about what I was going to tell you today about Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Well, all of a sudden it happened. I was saying, wheat and rice shot from guns is sensational. Terrific. Yes, sir. -y. Hey, stop yelling into me. Yep, and another thing. I... Hmm? Who said that? I did. A microphone talking? A microphone talking back to an announcer? Blame me? You shouting that way? Oh, gee, I'm sorry. You see, I do get excited whenever I think about Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Oh? Oh, look, Mike, they're so crisp, tender, delicious, made from only the flavor-rich premium grains, you know. I see. Why, they're shot from guns. Actually exploded up to eight times normal size. Why, they're colossal king size. Hey, take it easy. Oh, dear, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Well, you know, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are nourishing, good for you. Furnish extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. In fact, when it comes to a tasty, ready-to-serve breakfast cereal, why, there's no beating this eating. They're sensational, terrific! Oh, oh, there you go again. Oh, gosh. Maybe all I ought to say is, for a breakfast treat, buy Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Shot from guns. Now to continue. When Sergeant Preston and the constable were to take David Andrews to jail as a suspect in the murder of Jacques Beauvais, David's brother Barry suddenly confessed that he was the murderer. For a moment, the group was startled into tense silence. Then David spoke out. Barry, you don't know what you're saying. Yes, David, I do. But you were at home here with Mary. No, I wasn't. I followed you to town but missed you. I heard about the way Jacques knocked you down, so I went to his cabin. We got into a terrific argument and... Well, you know the rest. Now, see here, Barry, you can't tell me... Look, David, talking about it just makes things worse. I'm ready to go when you are, Sergeant. Very well, Barry. Oh, it can't be true. It just can't. Barry, you go into town with the constable. I'll talk to you later. You're not going with us, Sergeant? No, I'll take King and ride out to Shark's cabin. I want to look the situation over. I won't be long. When I get back, I'll be able to discuss this case with you and Barry. The constable returned to town, taking Barry with him. Later, Sergeant Preston and King arrived at the constable's office after investigating Jacques' cabin. Didn't take you very long, Sergeant. Long enough to look things over. You put Barry in one of the cells? Yes, I hated to do it. That's all right for the time being. Jacques' cabin's in neat order. Yes, it was that way when I found him. I see. Did you question Barry? No, I thought I'd wait till he came back. Good. We know the shark was knifed in the back, and the body, when you found it, lay in front of the stove. That's right. I noticed there's a full pot of coffee on the stove, and there were two clean cups on the table nearby. I take it you're leading up to something. I am. I feel sure Barry's lying, Bill, trying to protect David. Gosh. What makes you think Barry's lying? He said he had a terrific argument with Jacques. That's right. There was no sign of a struggle... And in a heated argument, Jacques wouldn't be apt to turn his back. Say, that sounds reasonable. Then you think David's really the killer. Well, I didn't say that. We'll see. Now, no one knows exactly how Jacques died, except the two prospectors, the coroner, and us. I know those prospectors very well. They'll keep mum. What's the next move? Question Barry? No. See that word gets around town that Barry has confessed. Right. I'm going out to talk to David again. If things work out, we may have the right man in jail by nightfall. Come on, King. After talking to David and giving him certain instructions, Sergeant Preston returned to the constable's office and waited. Later that afternoon, David finally entered. Well, David, you show yourself around town as I told you to? <coughs> yes, I did, Sergeant. Stayed in the cafe for quite some time. Look, Sergeant... I've done it because you said it might help, but I can't take it. Things that have been said about Barry, about both of us. Take it easy, David. Tell me what they've been saying. Well, it wasn't too bad till I went to the cafe. I went in and I sat alone on the back seat. Well, Dave, I guess you feel kind of bad about Barry, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do. Reckon he got plenty sore when he heard Jock knocked you down in here last night. I, I don't want to talk about it. Sure surprised me to hear Barry confess. Our Jock's cash is missing. Yeah, but the moment he'll get Barry to hand it over. Barry didn't steal Jock's money. I'm sure of that. Well, one way or another, it was stolen. If a man had killed, he'd steal. Barry, you'll hang for what he did. Shut up! Well, you like Shut up, do you hear? Well, What's Dave... It? Oh, you were here till you shouted. Didn't expect you to have the nerve to come in here today. I have the right to come in here if I want to and when I want to. Now, shut up, Carter, and let me alone. Don't you tell me to shut up, Andrews. Maybe you have got the right to come in. But if you hadn't come in last night, that local brother of yours wouldn't have followed my friend Jock and killed him. Well, if I had my way, I'd get a bunch together and take that confessed killer out to hang on the nearest tree. That's what... Stop that kind of talk! Stop it, you hear? Oh, and I suppose if I don't stop it, 
I'll be the next one to get a knife in the back, huh? <sighs> Getting out of here, Carter, before I forget myself. Things are bad enough without listening to that kind of talk. I'm sorry, David, to have you go through that. You won't have to put up with it again. Now I suggest you go back and visit with Barry for a while. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarge. Thanks a lot. Bill, the killer gave himself away. What do you mean? I don't see... Gil it. Carter said to David that Gil might be the next one to get a knife in the back. Yet no one except the two who found the body, the coroner, and us, knows that Jacques was killed from a knife stab in the back. Hey, that's right. The killer is the only other one who... Precisely. Gil mentioned that he was a friend of Jacques, too. I figure someone that he knew very well killed him. He was about to pour two cups of coffee and had his back turned when Carter struck... Now we've got to get proof. Where does Carter live, Bill? In that uh, dilapidated cabin on the edge of town. Good. I'm going to search his cabin when I have the chance. He must still be at the cafe. Come on, King. <laughs> Taking King with him, Sergeant Preston rode the short distance to Gil Carter's cabin. Finding the door unlocked, he and King entered, closing the door behind them. Preston searched the cabin thoroughly, but without success. Meanwhile, the great dog King sniffed around the place. He approached a large bucket filled with discarded rubbish. King sniffed and then whined. The intelligent dog had gone to Jacques' cabin with Preston. And now, near the bucket, he had caught a scent that reminded him of that visit. He put a paw on the edge of the bucket, which overturned with a clatter. Oh, 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 oh. It's your nose, eh, fella? What was in that bucket that you were... Oh, a money bag. Jacques money bag, I'm sure. And a stained knife. Good boy, King. That's proof against Carter. He hid the knife and stolen money in this bucket. The only important thing now is to get him to admit he put them there. Meantime, Gil Carter had approached his cabin and had seen the Mountie's horse outside. He moved cautiously to the window and looked in just as Sergeant Preston bent over and picked up the evidence. Gil drew his gun and suddenly smashed the window pane. Don't move, Mountie. I got the drop on you. He stood aiming at the startled Mountie, who stood up and swung around with a knife and money bag in his hand. I don't know how you managed to find where I hid the knife and the money, but you won't get a chance. King knew the meaning of a pointed gun. As Gil aimed, King sprang at Sergeant Preston, <laughs> knocking his master to one side out of Gil's line of fire. Don't, King. Quick, fella. Now we know Carter's the killer. You saved me from a bullet that time, King. Preston waited for a few moments and then cautiously made his way to the door while keeping an eye on the window. He held his gun in his hand, ready for instant action, but Gill kept back from the window. Sergeant Preston placed a restraining hand on King's back. Easy, boy. Easy. Then, very slowly, eased the door open. Suddenly, he heard hoofbeats. Yeah. He's taking my horse. Putting his fingers to his lips, Sergeant Preston sounded a shrill whistle. <laughs> His horse, Blackie, had been trained to such a signal, and at the sound of the whistle, stopped so suddenly that Gil Carter flew from the saddle. Get him, King! As Sergeant Preston ran toward the fallen man, he saw Gil suddenly scramble up to one knee, his attention focused on King. The Mountie also saw that Gil had his gun in his hand and was aiming it at the oncoming dog. King, look out! As he called out, the Mountie, still running, took quick aim at Gil and fired two fast shots. He saw the bullets whip up the ground inches in front of Gil Carter, so close that the man involuntarily fell back for a moment. That moment was enough for King to get near enough to spring. No, King grabbed Carter's gun arm and knocked him to the ground. No, get him off! Take him away! Don't, King! No, fella! Easy, boy. All right, Carter, you're through. I'm taking you in for the murder of Jacques Beauvais. When Sergeant Preston and King arrived at the constable's office with Gil Carter, Mary Andrews was there talking to the constable. Inside, Carter. All right. Watch him, King. Oh, Sergeant. Just a minute, Mary. Bill, is David still in with his brother? Yes, he is, Sergeant. I'll bring them both out here, would you please? Sure, right away. Sergeant, I can see you're involved in another case right now, but, well, if I could talk to you about well, poor Cheer Barry, up, I'm... Mary. No need for tears now. Here they are, Sergeant. Oh, David, I... Oh, Barry, we know Just that you did Just a didn't... minute, Mary. Sergeant... I was hoping David and Mary could be kept out of Mary, I have definite proof that you lied to protect David. Now, see here, Sergeant. If you're trying to say the David The prisoner is... I just brought in turned his back to both of you. Turn around, you. Well, Gil Carter. Yes, the man who killed Jacques Beauvais. 
I found the evidence against him, Bill, hidden in his cabin. Good work, Sergeant. Thank heaven. By golly, Barry, you did lie about it then. You must have thought that I did it. Uh, I didn't know what to think, David. Well, it's all over now. Take Carter back to his cell, Bill. Gladly. Come on, you. Sergeant, you and King are wonderful. If you really think so, we'll accept that invitation to eat with you, since we missed our lunch. <laughs> oh, swell, Sergeant. It'll be a celebration with you, the constable and King. Well, come to think of it, King really deserves that meal more than we do. He turned up the hidden evidence, knocked me out of the way of Carter's bullet. Good boy, King. <laughs> this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's adventure. (laughs) Don't any of you miss out, fellas and girls. Hurry to your grocers. While there's still time, get the exciting new Yukon Trail packages of swell-tasting Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Get every single one of the eight different packages that come with these keen Yukon cutout models. They're yours at no extra cost. Think of it. You get 59 of these larger, easier-to-build models in all. They're just the things you hear about in these adventures of Sergeant Preston and King along the Yukon Trail. You get dog sleds and teams of huskies you can hitch up and move around. You get the Dawson City Trading Post, Sergeant Preston's cabin in Whitehorse. You even get the interiors of buildings, the inside of a supply cache, of a gold mine, of a white horse general store. And remember, they're yours right now without box tops, without coupons. You get them right on packages of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. And only on the original crisp, fresh, shot from gun cereal that is never sold in bags or bulk. They're at your grocer's now. Hurry and get the complete set of eight Yukon Trail packages. Today, we have the pleasure of congratulating the Campfire Girls on the 40th anniversary of their founding. To celebrate this birthday, the Campfire Girls will have a special project called Discovery Unlimited, an adventure in creative living. So here's best wishes to all the 360,000 Campfire Girls all over the United States. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of Secret Orders. When I found an injured 10-year-old boy, I took him to the nearest shelter, which was a cabin in the woods. I didn't suspect that Cooks had planned to kill the owner of that cabin. They mistook me for the owner and jumped me from behind, knocking me unconscious. When they saw the police uniform beneath my parka, they decided that I, too, would have to die. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Your best bet for hot breakfast is Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, if you want to be a star in sports and school activities, make your hot cereal Quaker Oats, because Quaker Oats helps grow the stars of the future. You get more growth, more endurance from oatmeal than from any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.